Um, hi, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Jim Plaskolik. I am um, a professor here at, in ECE at UNM. Um, I've been involved in entrepreneurial activities for about 10 years now. This is my 10 year anniversary, so I've been doing this a long time. Uh, um, I have my most recent endeavor is I'm CEO of my own company. I call it IC Safety. Um, LLC, and I have um, five technologies actually that are either, I think, patented. One of them for sure is patented. The other ones I think are going through the process. Um, my area is in hardware security. Um, all the technology I, I've developed actually are in that space. I'm going to talk about one of those today that um, is that deals with protecting uh, device secret keys, your encryption keys to use to encrypt information, right? When you connect from your cell phone to your bank, for example, um, using what I call side channel countermeasures. And um, that's, I know, Greek at this point. <clears throat> and I'll define what the um, adversaries are, have come up with um, and the kinds of attacks that they're using to steal secret keys. Um, I... I'm a co-founder of a major conference actually in this space. It's called uh, Hardware and Security and Trust or Host. Uh, started it in 2008. Um, I'm an experimentalist. I have some pictures here of my laboratory. I do a lot of hands-on experimental work. I'm very good with chip building, device building, and FPGAs. I'm showing an FPGA here. Um, a lot of the stuff that we propose actually needs to, if it's going to be commercialized, it needs to operate in real environments. Uh, it can be cold outside like it is, well, maybe not today, but certainly a couple, maybe a week ago, right? Um, so extremes, right, minus 40 to 125C, right? Um, so we test a lot of our devices actually in a temperature chamber that I'm showing here. Um, the rest of this stuff is fairly standard stuff like oscilloscopes and power supplies and so on. Um, let's see if I can page forward here. There we go. <clears throat> okay, let me um, define the problem here um, in the security uh, space and the potential market covers sort of both of those at the same time. Everyone has heard of Internet of Things, right? IoT, um, it's taken over our lives. Um, and the number of per personalized devices and the corresponding secrets, right? How many passwords do you have now um, has increased dramatically and that's predicted to continue right for some time. Um, we all know about the kinds of things we're doing at home with home automation, right? Everything from controlling your microwave and light bulbs to of course, things that have been on the internet for some time now like TVs and so on. Uh, all this stuff needs to be protected. You don't want adversaries to gain access, for example, to your temperature control for your furnace, right? Wouldn't be good. A light bulb maybe is less threatening, but certainly security cameras and things, right? You can imagine there's a security risk associated with them all, and they all have passwords, and they all have keys and secrets, right? Um, the automobile, the self-driving car is a Google car over here. Um, so this, these things deal with what we as um, civilians, right, have to deal with, but there's also all times, all kinds of stuff going on inside of um, factories with industrial IoT. Um, some of our biggest customers are actually with the military. There's a lot of stuff going on in that space, right, and uh, electronic cash, right, another area that I'm sort of specializing in. Um, so IoT devices, um, and, and this really applies to any type of device, but are particularly vulnerable to what are called key stealing attacks by hackers because they're small. They're handheld devices and they have, these designers have a limited ability to actually incorporate any type of strong security features you might find on your desktops, for example. Okay, so there's this attack that was invented back when I was getting my PhD in 97. It's called differential power analysis. And it's a, an attack whereby adversaries will steal your device, right? Uh, maybe just borrow it even uh, for a small period of time. And then 
They can have it uh, encrypt uh, messages um, in some fashion. Um, and they essentially what can be done is the adversary can attach a probe right to the device, monitor the power supply. Um, the power supply will produce what's called current transients. And those current transients are translated into voltage transients. And so you can use an oscilloscope actually then to measure the power supply transient as the device is encrypting with that secret key, right? It could be in, you know, encrypting dummy data or whatever the adversary is able to do to manipulate the device. Um, the point is, is that the adversary is not able to access the key. The key is stored in some secure place inside of the device, but they can actually exercise the device to carry out encryption and then measure these power transients. And if you measure enough of them and correlate them, what you can effectively do is reverse engineer that key without that key ever being revealed in digital form outside of the chip. Okay, and so this is a threat. It's, it's actually a very big threat. It's been a threat. Um, there's been lots of countermeasures proposed over the years, right? That was 20 some years ago. And it's still considered an unsolved problem. Um, in fact, the research that we're presenting, that I'm presenting today, the technology I'm presenting is actually funded by NSF um, about two and a half years ago with a $500,000 grant. Um, so it's still obviously very relevant in terms of a problem. <clears throat> so what are we doing? What's our approach? Well, we're very good at physical design layer things, right? What I call down in the trenches kinds of research. Um, you know, physical layouts of devices, um, the process variations and things that occur at the lowest layer, right, of this design hierarchy, right, that is a multi-billion dollar industry that's involved in building these microelectronic devices. Um, so what, we do, what we've done is we've said, hey, look, the reason this differential power analysis attack is so effective at stealing keys is because the hardware is invariant, right? It doesn't change. And because it doesn't change and the attacker is attacking one device where he doesn't have to deal with all the other variations that occur, um, he can then average, collect lots of these waveforms, having the encryption algorithm run for literally thousands or tens of thousands of encryptions and, and, and collect lots of this data and average out all the noise. And we said, well, if we change the hardware over time, that should be an effective countermeasure. And so what do I mean by that? Well, we do we in, we come up with two techniques. One's called implementation diversity, and these are tied together, of course, um, where we actually propose how to change the hardware over time in real time, right? Uh, as the device is, is encrypting, um, and then we do we reprogram the device, and this is applicable to what's called an FPGA, and we'll get into a little bit of details on that later. But um, we reprogram the device using a technique called dynamic partial reconfiguration. So the idea is that we're going to make, create a moving target architecture in this device so that as it encrypts over time, it's going to be, in fact, carrying out the exact same function, which is encryption. But the hardware that actually does it, the logic gates and the structure of the wires and so on, are going to change in the, it turns out, you know, hundreds of microseconds intervals. Right, and by doing that, this correlation that the adversary was in fact using to reverse engineer that key that was being used for that encryption is actually gonna be much more difficult or impossible. We call this side channel power resistance for encryption algorithms uh, using dynamic partial reconfiguration. This is only applicable to FPGAs, right? But FPGAs are actually being integrated into ASICs and microprocessors now. So this is actually gonna be very, uh, you know, useful going forward, right, as these FPGAs uh, become a part of mainstream, all mainstream technologies, right? We have this uh, acronym SPREAD that we refer to the technique with. SPREAD rapidly changes the implementation characteristics of components of the uh, encryption algorithm while maintaining equivalent functionality, where right? we can't change encryption. So we have to make sure that the same logic function is being performed. We're just changing the structure of the gates the logic functions of the gates and the, in the wires, right? But we're guaranteeing that, of course, the encryption algorithm will continue to encrypt exactly like it like it's supposed to. 
and, we, and using DPR, which is, refers to dynamic partial reconfiguration. So let me define these two terms a little bit better, and then um, we'll talk about the current state, and then we'll finish. Um, so what is implementation diversity? Well, we use what are called computer-aided design tools or CAD tools to construct different versions of the encryption algorithm. Um, and we do this using some of the lingo and tech, you know, uh, technologies that are available right uh, to building chips um, using different sets of logic gates. We call them standard cell libraries. And, and essentially we use these commercial CAD tools right, in a description of uh, an encryption algorithm. We call that behavioral VHDL. It's a description of the hardware that will in fact carry out encryption. Um, and then we craft a set of standard cell libraries that are different, right, in small ways. We just take one gate out of one library, believe it or not, and add a gate to another library. And the synthesis tool will produce something completely different at, at the physical layer in terms of how it actually implemented that function. Um, in particular, we're going to be focused on these S boxes. We'll get to here in a minute. But these are going to be the workhorses of the encryption algorithm. There are small components that are part of the encryption algorithm. So again, just adding and removing gates uh, can make very dramatic differences. And I'm showing a physical layout of an FPGA here. And believe it or not, all the green wires, all the green here is actually wiring re right between gates. And the gates are shown as these little boxes here, right? And this was the same S box function implemented using one library. And here it is again, using a different library. And just from this bird's eye view, you can see that it's very different. There's a lot more density here and less density here. It carries out the same function. It's just that it's wired differently, right? And that's what's key here. So how do we make this work? Well, we use something that's called dynamic partial reconfiguration. DPR refers to the ability to reprogram the device. I mean, this is actually changing the hardware, right? This is possible in field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs. We do this on the fly, right, to change the structural and um, actually not its functional, sorry, that's a typo. So we're not gonna change its functional characteristics. We're only gonna change its structural characteristics, right? It's gonna maintain the same function. Reprogramming changes the logic gates in the wiring as I was just illustrating on the previous slide. And partial here, actually in the name, refers to the ability to change specific regions of the device. This is really gonna be useful to make this practical and licensable, sellable, right? In other words, the current FPGA technology allows you to reprogram a small region of the device while the rest of the device keeps operating, right? Because this is important because it's going to take some time to reprogram that region. And so we don't want to stop encryption, right, while we, we reprogram the region. No one would buy it because in, in your encryption would, would become very, very slow. As, you know, it takes about a millisecond, right, to, well, actually about 100 microseconds to program each of these regions. And you can do tens of thousands of encryptions over that time interval, right? So this is a really nice feature of PGAs where we can actually select a region, say, okay, mux it out so it's not being used. And that's what I'm showing down here with the S boxes, right? We create what's called a hole. And then these other S boxes keep operating and encryption keeps running, right? While we reprogram this one region. And then once it's reprogrammed, we then mux it in, and then select another region and we reprogram the, ne the next region. And every time we reprogram it, we reprogram it with a different implementation. So this is what we, why we call it a moving target architecture because the hardware implementation actually changes as a function of time. And so in the AES, which is the advanced encryption standard, it's a popular encryption algorithm that everyone uses, they just don't know it, right? Um, There's 16 of these identical copies of these S boxes. Right, and so we can create this muxing structure where we can select a select one, reprogram it, and then um, you know, as soon as we get done, we mux that in, mux out, uh, mux mux out another one. So, what are the features? Um, the benefits and features here: spread implements uh, implements a countermeasure, defeating the fundamental assumption right on which DPA depends, and that is that the underlying circuit implementation right remains invariant. Right, by changing the hardware, we're changing the transients because the transients are produced, of course, by the signals that are propagating through that hardware. Um, spread is autonomous, right, in the sense that it can be implemented entirely within the programmable logic, and we have an implementation. Uh, mitigating attempts that attempt to disable it, for example, 
I mean, this is not like being run from your microprocessor. This is actually in a hardware reprogrammable region of the FPGA that can't be accessed by the adversary. Um, and then spread uses, again, we don't have time to talk about this, but most of the technologies that are uh, that I'm licensing right now successfully actually deal with what are called physical and clonable functions. And these are, in fact, functions or security primitives that are able to generate secret keys. And then this is this technique is designed to protect them from being stolen. But a lot of my technologies that we have actually out there in commercial space right now um, refer to the this this classification of physical and clonable function right we can incorporate that directly within this engine right mitigating the vulnerabilities that are associated with why physical and clonable functions are popular because we don't have to store the key anywhere right in any type of non-volatile memory we generate it from process variations that occur in the device itself that's another talk and we don't have time for that today Right, and in this DPA technique, we were proving it out, and it shows that the adversary is not going to be able to guess the key because it never emerges as a dominant right uh, guess, right, in in the techniques that the adversary uses to um, to decide what the keys are, the key bytes are, right. And there's uh, 16 key bytes actually. This is only one of them. Okay, current state, and then we're done. Um, FPGAs are low-cost devices that are well-suited for many types of applications, right? IoT being one of them. Um, this is why it's going to be, you know, great for the market, right? Because IoT is in the billions, right? The ability to reprogram the FPGA or portions of it, right, at runtime provides several big advantages with respect to security, right? One of them being that we can do this type of technique this um, a moving target a moving or uh, target architecture type of method. Um, and then of course we can do pops in there as well. The term hardware security and trust has, has been coined as emerged, right? To refer to these types of next generation security primitives and features. So, you know, hold on to your hat, they're coming um, as, as they, you know, to replace a lot of the weaknesses of software security based methods. So the spread tech technology provides an FPGA solution to adversarial key stealing attacks right, carried out on all types of devices and systems. We build a prototype. It's currently under evaluation. We have lots of gigabytes of data collected. We expect to receive what's called an NMSBA, um, which is a small business association award. Uh, the engineers, uh, there's some engineers at San Diego National Labs that are very interested, right, in this technology, right, and hopefully we'll get them, if we get this award to carry out, not hopefully, they will, but carry out an independent assessment of it. Um, we have some uh, government contractors that we're already in touch with, uh, we're communicating with and tech transferring to with the puff test stuff, who are interested in the results of our evalu web evaluation and could be potentially licensing the technology. And that's it, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jim, um, for your presentation. Sure. Um, I think we only have uh, one question. So uh, only recently have FPGAs become more energy efficient in order to rival ASICs um, in regards to power consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, does your um, device demand a significant increase in power consumption for the FPGAs? No, it, it, you mean because of the dynamic partial reconfiguration. Actually, I have some slides on how much power it takes to actually do these fairly small regions. The fact that we only have to do small regions is a, is a real benefit. If we had to reprogram the whole device, yes, there's a fa fairly significant power transient that's generated, right? Con power consumption that's generated um, to do that. But because these regions are small, very small, um, we can actually, uh, we show that the, the power consumption actually is on the same order as the, much, in fact, much smaller than the encryption and um, energy consumption itself. So it only adds a small delta, right, to the power consumption that the encryption algorithm is drawing uh, on its own. Remember, it's running at this very high speed, you know, 20, 50, 100 megahertz, right? Um, and so... Yeah, so it's we don't see that as a as an issue, um, and then you know FPGAs are becoming increasingly popular as uh, as your as the viewer has um, pointed out, um, and you know Intel of course is starting to integrate their their, their acquisition of of the Altera into their products. Um, they're becoming popular in the cloud, 
right? And there are actually embedded FPGAs that you can now, companies that are selling embedded FPGAs that can actually be placed in the microprocessors and in, in the, what we call ASICs, which are these sort of specialized devices, right? And so you, you can have, you know, your, your microprocessor environment along with a small region that can be reconfigured, right? This type of technique would be ideal, right, for that type of environment. So we see the future is very bright. Um, going forward 